We had, we had generated a lot of MRD data when we were doing work with FCR and FCR-based regimens, and then we had the small molecule inhibitors become available, particularly the BTK inhibitors, and weren't seen as deep of remission. But with venetoclax, it really has re-ushered re in a, an era again of discussion about MRD, and it's a tr treatment that is tolerated well by uh, patients, including older patients, venetoclax, and w I think we're able to have a discussion about um, depth of remission, including for patients who are older and 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 um, had been less able to tolerate the more intensive chemoimmunotherapy regimens. I think it's probably important to have a little discussion about venetoclax and some of the features of venetoclax that are clinically relevant and important. I think with Murano, we started to see more usage. Murano allowed um, or uh, enabled or was the reason for approval of uh, venetoclax no, not only in relapsed, CL, uh, relapsed CLO with 17P, which was the initial indication for monotherapy, but now broadly for, for relapsed disease. But maybe, Anthony, we can start with initiating treatment and whether th what's the feature that concerns us most in terms of initiation of venetoclax and as patients are on a stable dose, what are the other features that we need to look for? Yeah, I feel like from an AE perspective, venetoclax is a relatively easy drug to understand. It's sort of a, has two major AEs that we think about. One is electrolyte abnormalities and renal dysfunction, the tumor lysis syndrome, which is an early event. And the second are hematologic toxicities, which can occur early or late, where you can see largely neutropenia, but to a certain extent, thrombocytopenia. I think a distant third in terms of the AE profile are GI toxicities, which are relatively early events and I think relatively limited for patients and so not, not as important. Venetoclax is a drug which does require training to use. It's not difficult, but it does require an understanding that patients have to have a prophylaxis and monitoring strategy to mitigate the risk of developing tumor lysis syndrome, which is largely based on the bulk of disease at the time venetoclax is started and patients can be, strat can be stratified into whether or not they have a low, intermediate, or high-risk disease based on their absolute lymphocyte count and the degree of lymphadenopathy. And based on those findings, there are very reasonable strategies available for prophylaxis and monitoring, which when employed work very well in terms of minimizing the risk of clinical and also laboratory tumor lysis syndrome. The difficulty is actually making the, taking the understanding and the training and making it practical in your office or your practice because there are time constraints to when laboratory studies need to be performed at baseline, for example, or at eight hours or six to eight hours in a, in a patient who's low risk. And in high risk patients, you're looking at laboratory studies that are being performed on a scale of baseline four, eight, 12 hours the next day. And so logistically, you need a stat lab. You need to have a turnaround time that works in the, in the context of your office in order for the drug to be practical. And then there are outpatient and inpatient strategies. I think if you can make that happen in the office, that toxicity is almost non-existent. The hematologic toxicity is an interesting one because even in the ramp up, you can start to see patients develop neutropenia, for example. The nice thing about it is that if you recognize it, growth factors work well, it can almost eliminate that toxicity. And even when it occurs and maybe isn't treated with a growth factor, there's this tremendous discordance between the amount of neutropenia that you see grade three, four, which is high, and the proportion of patients who develop febrile neutropenia, which is actually quite low, under 5%, if I had to summarize all the studies. I would say, unless I'm forgetting another toxicity, that's really all you need to know about toxicity management for venetoclax. I would like to um, add a couple of points here. So it seems that um, um, in addition to risk st stratifying patients, there are strategies which you can use to um, reduce those risks. And um, you presented Captivate data at ASCO, and there was data here at ASH uh, where um, using ibrutinib uh, prior to venetoclax for two or three months actually mitigates, partially mitigates the risk of TLS, if not completely. In fact, there are very, very, very few laboratory TLS uh, cases in those studies. Um, the German trials, uh, combina when uh, with, uh, induction of with bendamustine followed by um, CD20 novel agent combinations, also mitigated some of the TLS risks. Um, uh, finally, uh, there are some s uh, studies ongoing out there which use uh, abinutuzumab uh, treatment prior to introduction of venetoclax. So there are clear uh, ways uh, to mitigate uh, those risks by potentially uh, uh, using a lead-in 
uh, with those agents. Can I just add one other thing though? I just want to emphasize there's not yet an FDA approved strategy to mitigate risk. The Murano strategy, rituximab, follows venetoclax escalation, venetoclax as a monotherapy, obviously. I think one of the dangers of those methods, or the, of those methods, is that number one, there's no training really available for practitioners who may read an article and think it's interesting to escalate every three days or to add ibrutinib before you want to give venetoclax. And so I think the danger there is that until it's a labeled use, it may put patients at risk trying to sort of cut corners with a strategy that when you employ it works perfectly well to mitigate the risk. The other, the other thing I would add is that you're exactly right that all of those debulking strategies do decrease the risk of TLS if you then still follow the ramp up schedule that's used. Right. And so right. even though right. the risk is lower, right. the logistics are the same right now uh, with the current ramp up schedule. And so there are a few tricks that we can use to try to make this a little easier in, in the practice setting. Uh, one of the things I've done with some of my patients is on the day that they plan to start venetoclax, have them get up early and take the drug at six o'clock in the morning. And they come in and see me and get the six hour labs at noon. And then that way we can turn around the labs in the, in the afternoon and make sure that they're safe. Uh, if there's issues getting labs back in a timely fashion, you can also admit patients to the hospital and, and do it on the inpatient setting, which is a bit inconvenient, but certainly the safest thing for the patient. So I think, certainly agree with everything that's been said, and in particular right now, following the label uh, to start venetoclax is important to make sure that it's being done safely. Uh, but I think additional kind of creative strategies need to be explored to simplify how we do yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Those are research strategies. And uh, I think another point regarding the hematologic toxicities is uh, if we want to use venetoclax in combination with chemoimmunotherapy, so that's my, that may actually be a limiting factor. You know, so it's been used with our shop in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma in clinical trials. And um, um, the, 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 the dosing schedule is uh, not daily there, so it's used on days one through 10, and then the drug is stopped because of the uh, risk of, risks of neutropenia.